Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to our webinar on the overview of the insurance claim process. Uh, my name is Steve Rappaport. I'm a partner at Sachs Sachs Kaplan. As many of you on this call know, Sachs Sachs Kaplan has been representing community associations for over 35 uh, years uh, and is experts in the community association, condo, HOA, and country club uh, practice. Um, but one thing we have not always uh, been able to provide our clients is first party insurance coverage uh, representation. And we have with us today, uh, Larry Bache from the Merlin Law Group. Uh, it's very, uh, it's an honor for us to be able to announce to our clients uh, that we are now teaming up with the Merlin Law Group to, to provide the best representation for our condominium homeowners associations and community association clients with their first party insurance claims. Uh, the Merlin Law Group is the largest law firm in the United States focusing solely on first party property cases and has over 35 years experience in this uh, endeavor. Uh, and so with that, you all came here to uh, listen to Larry and not myself. So I'm going to jump off the webinar and turn it over to Larry. Uh, Larry, thank you and thank uh, the Merlin Law Group for being a part of this and for helping to organize this. And uh, we look forward to hearing uh, your presentation. Thanks. Thank you, Stephen. Appreciate that introduction. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Larry Bache. Um, I do work with the Merlin Law Group. And as Stephen mentioned, uh, we are here to talk about first party property insurance claims. So we will go ahead and get started. The purpose of today is really to give an overview of the insurance claim process. Um, in my experience in handling claims with HOAs and COAs is the terminology is different, it's unique. A lot of people do not realize uh, what a public adjuster is, what an assignment of benefits is, what is my and who is my insurance adjuster and even who my insurance company is. And so the purpose of today is to give an overview of who the people are and the parties that participate in the claim process so that everybody can feel a little more comfortable with who they're talking to and who they should be talking to. As Stephen mentioned, we have 64 attorneys across the country nationwide that specialize in first party property claims. We do nothing else. I have personally practiced this area of law my entire legal career and I'm in my 10th year. And before that, I clerked with Chip Merlin while in law school out of our Tampa office. Our Tampa office is our home office, but we have offices throughout the state of Florida, as far north as Panama City, Florida, as far south as Key West. Another one of our uh, fully staffed offices is in West Palm Beach. Chip Merlin is the founder and president of the Merlin Law Group. Um, Chip Merlin has been practicing this area of law exclusively for more than 35 years. Uh, Chip started off as a defense attorney working for one of the larger defense firms in the country and switched sides in about 1984, 1985 and founded the Merlin Law Group. Uh, Chip is licensed pretty much all over the country. We have lawyers that are licensed in almost every single state. Um, those licenses are listed there, but for purposes of today, it's important that you know that our offices, including Chip, are licensed in every federal court in the state of Florida as well as the state of Florida. Obviously, that's me. Um, I'm licensed in multiple jurisdictions. I have practiced in more than 17 different states over the last 10 years, focused only and primarily on first party property insurance. Uh, that is my email address. If you have any questions, please let me know. Uh, if you have any additional questions regarding a claim that you may have, please let Stephen know with SACS and he will make sure that we have a, a file review set up for you specifically. So we need to start off with what is first party property insurance and what is a first party property insurance claim. Uh, the best way to explain it is it's if you have a claim under your own insurance policy. A lot of people um, get confused on who exactly is paying for the claim. Um, the prime example is a car insurance claim where driver A is driving and hits driver B. If driver B has a claim against driver A's insurance, that is a third party claim. Driver B is seeking benefits from driver A's insurance. If driver B is seeking insurance from his own insurance company, that would be a first party claim. And the reason that's significant is that there are certain duties and obligations that a first party insurance company owes to its claimant that it does not owe to a third party claimant. For everybody that's participating in today's webinar, if you have a claim, that we're going to talk about it would be a first party claim. So what are some examples of first party claims? 
Well, obviously a hurricane, okay? Hurricane Irma, Hurricane Michael, those are claims that would be under the condominium association or your homeowners association's policy. Another common example is gonna be a water loss, a fire loss, and a hail loss. Those are types of claims that would be under your insurance policy, and that would be an instance where you would need to consult with a first party property insurance attorney. Um, another type of loss that we're dealing with right now is business interruption regarding the COVID-19 claims. So those policies are triggered, and then you have certain duties and obligations that we're going to get into in more detail. But the first duty that I want to discuss today is the timely notice of a loss, not a claim. So the insurance policies require an obligation of you, the policyholder, or you, the property manager. So I know we're dealing a lot with property managers. Um, they need to be aware of these terms and these obligations. And the first obligation is to report the damages and report the loss. A, a very common example that I have seen as a result of Hurricane Irma uh, recently is the property managers and the boards uh, do not want to report a claim because obviously they're concerned about uh, the implications of the premium, implications of reporting of a claim. And what they do is they wait and they wait to see what the repair costs are going to be throughout the process. You know, for example, if you have a 50 building association and you have a leak, um, how much does that leak cost to repair? And then as time goes on, the damages accumulate until the point that it exceeds the deductible. So the biggest mistake that I see with the timely reporting of a claim is people have taken that to mean that you don't have to report a claim if it does not exceed your deductible. Um, that's not accurate. Uh, the policy does not say report a claim. The policy is, requires timely notice or prompt notice of a loss that can be triggered under the policy. So it's also important to remember that when you have a loss, like a hurricane loss or a fire loss or a water loss, there's additional damages that may not be visible to you that need to be investigated. So oftentimes with these Hurricane Irma claims, especially with tile roofing systems, you may have underlayment damage that you're not aware of. You may have decking damage that you're not aware of. You may have tiles that have been displaced or loosened that you're not aware of until somebody actually investigates those roofing systems and actually walks them and physically manipulates them to determine if there's been wind uplift. We then see a claim is reported a year after the loss, two years after the loss, and even now. Um, I actually received a phone call last week for a claim in Naples, and they have a claim that has not been reported. Now, we're going to have to deal with that issue of timely notice. Uh, the good news is, is that in Florida, you can report a claim untimely as long as the insurance company has not been prejudiced. Now, we can do an entire webinar on Florida law on notice and prejudice, but for purposes of today, please just know that there's an obligation to report damages, not just a claim that you may believe exceeds your deductible or does not exceed your deductible. I would also recommend that if you're unsure about whether or not you have sufficient damages that would trigger the policy, you can also consult with a contractor or a public adjuster that will evaluate those damages for you and provide you with an estimate for your evaluation. The point of this slide is do not just assume that you do not have to report damages because you're not aware that they exceed your deductible. This leads us to the next point regarding timely notice. Uh, Florida law changed in 2011 where they've restricted the timely notice or defined what a timely notice is under Florida law. And that's found in Florida statute 627-70132. The statute um, simply requires that all claims, whether it's a freshly reported claim or it's a claim that has a supplement that was not identified earlier, they must be reported within three years from the time that the storm made landfall. So if you're in South Florida and Hurricane Irma struck your property on September 9th of 2017, you have until September 9th of 2020 to report any damages that you want to claim under your policy. 
So here we are on June 24th, 2020. We have less than 90 days to ensure that all damages are being reported. In other words, if you're going to evaluate the windows, you need to get those evaluated right away. I see a very common example where the policyholder or the property manager wants to finish the roof claim before they supplement the claim for windows or supplement for interior damages. You cannot wait more than three years after the loss to submit a supplemental claim. It's also not best practice to not report or identify all the damages that you can initially so that you don't have to deal with a timely notice or an untimely notice defense of those claims. So in summary, you have three years from the time the storm makes landfall to report any portion of your claim. If you do not report it within that three-year period, you lose your right and those claims are barred. Now, this three-year limitation period is not to be confused with a statute of limitations. A statute of limitations is the time period that a claimant has to file a lawsuit against a third party or, in our context, the insurance carrier. In Florida, you have five years from the date of the event or the date of loss. It's not five years from the date of denial. It's five years from the date of loss. So if Hurricane Irma made landfall in your area on September 9th or September 10th of 2017, for example, you would have until September 9th or September 10th of 2022 to file a lawsuit. There's two other important factors that we have to discuss as it relates to statute of limitations. The number one question that I have commonly run into from property managers especially with the Lloyd's policy or a Zurich policy or any type of excess liability policy is the policy will say you have two years to file a lawsuit in the suit against us provision. There are some jurisdictions that an insurance carrier can limit the law or the statute of limitations by the contract. So there are some jurisdictions where if you have a five-year statute like we have in Florida, versus a policy or a contractual limitation period of two years, the contract would control. And you would only have two years to bring that lawsuit based on the contractual limitation period. In other words, the contractual limitation period would supersede the statute of limitations for five years. In Florida, the law does not allow the contract to limit the statute. So even if you have a Zurich policy, even if you have an ICAP policy or a Lloyd's policy or Lexington is another common one, and it says two years, you still have five years to bring that lawsuit. So your claim is not barred. I've had property managers give uh, improper advice on that issue because the agent will mislead the property manager and direct them to the contractual limitation period and say, listen, there's nothing you can do. It's already been two years. In Florida, that's not true. You have five years. Now, Larry, how does that play with the three-year limitation that you just discussed in the prior slide under Florida Statute 627-70132? Well, let's talk about that. You have, let's use Hurricane Irma because I know most of our associations are going to be in South Florida, and I know our managers are as well. And Irma was so devastating across the entire state that regardless of where you are, you're very likely dealing with an association that has an Irma claim. So I'm going to walk you through an example because I'm an example kind of guy. Um, some of this stuff is kind of dense to make sure that you understand how the three-year limitation period and the five-year statutory period, they go together and how they work together. September 9th, 2017, Hurricane Irma hits the Miami area. You have until September 9th, 2020 to report any claims that you want to make under that policy. Assuming that you comply with the statute for timely notice, you have five years from September 9th of 2017 to file a lawsuit if the carrier does not properly pay the claim. That means you would have till September 9th, 
2022 to file a lawsuit. So if you have any questions about that, please let Stephen know. And, you know, Merlin and, and SSC will get together and make sure we provide you with an analysis. What are the additional duties uh, for the policyholder? Now, this is important for property managers because a lot of times you're getting fielded with questions and you're getting document requests from these insurance companies. I mean, they're just ruthless with what they ask for. Um, it's, it's exhausting. Uh, most of it's not relevant. Most of it is really just to, you know, provide for a, uh, you know, fishing expedition. Um, and we can talk about how we narrow those requests on another webinar. But there are certain duties and obligations that you must comply with if you want to get the claim paid. Number one is protect the property from further damage. And oftentimes, uh, this is best illustrated where the contractor comes in and they tarp the roofing system. So if building number seven reports a leak, you need to make sure that you take care of that leak. Property managers, please instruct the contractors to document the damages that they're repairing and the remediation that they're doing. That will help a lot in getting the claim paid from the very beginning. Obviously, you must provide access to the property. We're going to talk about the different people that will be accessing the property in a little bit, but make sure that you provide access. They have the right to inspect the roofs. <clears throat> the next requirement can have an entire separate webinar on it. It's called the proof of loss, and it's really a term of art in our world, the first party world. A proof of loss is a specific form document that the insurance company provides to you. And it's a, it's a sworn statement in proof of loss, meaning that a representative for the association, not the property manager, I understand that the property manager often will get authority to execute documents on behalf of the association. I have seen property managers legally execute proof of loss forms, and I have seen property managers legally and ethically execute assignment of benefit forms. I want to caution against this. I believe it's best practice to have an association member of the board execute these documents that are being submitted to the insurance company. I understand it may not be as easy. I understand uh, in working these claims that a lot of these board members live all over the country. They do not full, they not live in Florida full time. Many of uh, these board members are a little bit older than, than I am, and they're not as familiar with technology, scanning emails. I know it's getting better. And sometimes it's just easier uh, to, to get the authority and get it executed because you have a notary at the office. There's nothing wrong with that if you have the authority from the board. Make sure there's a vote. Make sure it's documented in the minutes that you have the authority to do it. But our recommendation to our law firm is simply this. Have the association execute these documents so that as a property manager, you're not exposing yourself to any liability. The next requirement is one that a lot of people uh, get confused that they even have to sit for. It's called an examination under oath. And it's a fancy term for really a pre-suit deposition. It looks like a deposition, it acts like a deposition, but it's not a deposition, okay? So you have an examination under oath, which essentially, uh, there's a document request attached to it, and I'm sure most of you have dealt with this before. And it's an extensive document request, which you can obviously ask to narrow down for what's important. And you provide these documents in a notebook to the insurance company, and then they want a representative of the association to sit for the examination under oath. And they will hire an attorney that will come in with a court reporter who will transcribe the questions and answers provided for the EUO or examination under oath. Um, and it looks just like a deposition. And then the uh, representative will be asked to sign off on the examination under oath transcript. This is a investigative tool that is allowed and required to be complied with under Florida law if the insurance company requests it. My recommendation, our firm's recommendation, is kind of a common sense recommendation. If the insurance company is hiring an attorney to ask one of your board members questions, what do you think the recommendation should be to the association? Right. 
they should get an attorney involved as well. And that's where you know SSC can step in. Um, we, you know, we'll meet with them. We'll meet together with your client, and we'll make sure that they're prepared for the examination under oath, where we have the documents. We'll have a bait stamps. We'll have them in a, in a very chronological order fashion or by topic fashion. Um, all of our staff, all of our paralegals are very familiar with this process. We do it for depositions as well. Um, do not let it intimidate you. A lot of times these notices go out for one reason, and it's to intimidate the insured. Um, I've had insurance adjusters tell me that these letters go out because a lot of times there's no response. And a lot of times the claims will go away because they intimidate the property manager or they intimidate the insured. Uh, there is no reason for that. 90% uh, of the time on a hurricane claim, 99% of the time, there is no suspicion of any wrongdoing on behalf of the association. In reality, there's really two purposes for this from a practical standpoint. Number one, the insurance companies are overwhelmed with claims. Their adjusters are overwhelmed. They need help. If it's a large enough loss, they can justify having an attorney come in, investigate, participate in the claims decision, um, request documents, and they can trust the attorney is going to do a good job. The second reason is they want to know facts about the building. They want to know how much did you spend to remediate? Uh, what steps did you take to remediate the damages or mitigate the damages? Uh, how old are the roofing systems? Have there any pre are there any uh, repairs before the hurricane hit the property with mismatched tile or outdated product? Um, has the underlayment been replaced at any point in time in the past? They want to know the age of the windows, if windows are part of the claim. They want to know the board meeting minutes. Did people complain of window leaks after the storm? They're just trying to piece together the puzzle, but there's no doubt about it. They're definitely trying to build policy defenses. That's why they do an EUO. But there's no reason to be intimidated by it if you're prepared. In fact, most of the time, after I do an EUO, I'm able to resolve the claim because they're able to check the box off that they spoke to the insured, that they investigated the claim. At that point in time, we can usually move forward to their coverage decision. Here's some key terms, and really, it's a dichotomy that I want to make sure everybody's aware of. Because I watch television, I watch sports a, a lot of times, and I see LeBron James, I see Chris Paul, I see my beloved Peyton Manning uh, advertising and marketing on behalf of insurance companies. And I want to make sure that the policyholders, the board members, and the property managers understand the distinction between an agency and the claims department. The product that's being sold is what you're seeing on television. And ideally, it's supposed to be a great product. And insurance is important, and it is a great product when it works. Our economy requires insurance, and it's a great system. However, it has nothing to do with the claims department. Your, your agent is going to have one role if you choose to use it in a claim, and that is to provide notice of the loss to the carrier. At that point, the agent has no involvement in how much money is going to be paid in the investigation of the damages or investigation of the losses. And I know these brokerages, I know these agencies market to property managers just like everybody else does. Understand they have no involvement in the claims process. The claims process is totally different. The agent's gone and now you're going to have an insurance adjuster. More often than not, with the audience that we're speaking with today, property managers, um, condominium association members, HOA members, you're going to be dealing with a larger insurance company, whether it's American Coastal, American Capital, uh, Zurich, Lexington, Lloyd's, ICAT, the list goes on. Those insurance companies will outsource the claims process. Okay, that's right. They actually do not adjust the claims. The biggest surprise when I meet with my clients that I tell them is there's been nobody on behalf of the insurance company. The actual insurance company, no employee, 
has been to the property to inspect the loss. Instead, they send what is called an independent insurance adjuster. And most states don't even require an independent adjuster to have a license. The most common independent adjusters that you have probably dealt with will be Veraclaim, um, Ingle Martin and Associates, Crawford and Company. I mean, those are the big ones. Um, and, and they actually do not work for the insurance company. In fact, they don't even receive the insurance policy most of the time. And most of the time, they're not even provided the insurance company's claim guidelines. Their job is to go to the property, document the damages, and submit those photographs and initial reporting to the desk adjuster. So the independent adjuster is the person that you will meet on site. That independent adjuster has no authority to cut a check or provide coverage. They will, if you ask them, they will tell you, we have no authority to make a coverage decision. Overwhelmingly, that is where the house of cards falls apart. Um, I have cases on my desk, our firm deals primarily with cases that the insurance companies, professionals that they have outsourced, let everybody down. They let the insurance company down for doing a poor investigation. And most importantly, they let you down as a property manager or policyholder in the investigation of the claim, especially policyholders that are unrepresented. There's a lot of reasons for this, but the two biggest reasons that we've identified is number one, the independent adjuster is too busy. Oftentimes, they will be asked to go look at five or six associations over a two-day period. And oftentimes, that may be in excess of 200 buildings. And we've identified many cases where the independent adjusters don't even get on the roofs to inspect damages as a result of Hurricane Irma or Hurricane Michael. Instead, they drive around the buildings, they document what they can see on street level, missing tiles, dislodged tiles, or broken tiles, and they put together a very quick estimate, and that's what they do and they submit that to the desk adjuster. The desk adjuster happily issues a letter that says, this does not exceed the policy, it's deductible. And we're not denying the claim, but you did not suffer damages where we owe you a payment. So that is actually who's involved in the claim, not your agent, not a representative of the insurance company or an employee of the insurance company. It is a third party that has very little information and has too many claims to inspect. The second, most critical failure that I see with an independent adjuster is their lack of experience. Oftentimes, the insurance companies will vet the third party independent adjusting company and they will require certain credentials of the top layer management of the IA or independent adjusting company. And those guys are qualified, there's no doubt about it. Um, you know, they're 30 year employees, 20 year employees, they've got the licenses, they've got the experience. Unfortunately, that's not who investigates your loss. Instead, they'll get 50 assignments, 100 assignments, 200 assignments from an insurance company after a, a hurricane, and they hire anybody they can to go out and do these inspections. And most of the time, where I see, remember, I'm involved in claims that did not go well. So there's a lot of claims that go perfectly fine, and that's great. But the ones that I'm involved in, the independent adjusters often were working at Subway six months before the storm. You know, I've had Taco Bell. I've had no experience at all with adjustment of a claim. And they essentially just write a scope, submit it to the desk adjuster. And the desk adjuster knows nothing about the qualifications of the person that actually inspected the property. So that is what is and what is not an independent adjuster. A desk adjuster. A desk adjusters are typically going to be employees of the insurance company. They're the ones that are gonna review the photo report from the independent adjuster to make the coverage decision. The desk adjuster is the one that signs the reservation of rights letter or any correspondence that's from the insurance company directed to you as the property manager and or your association. The desk adjuster will have the guidelines and will apply the guidelines to the photographs provided to the desk adjuster. Unfortunately, the desk adjuster's coverage decision will be limited based on the information 
provided to the desk adjuster by the independent adjuster. At that point in time, you will receive a coverage decision, but that's who the desk adjuster is. If you are dealing with uh, the carriers we've discussed, which you typically are, you're gonna be dealing with a TPA, which is the third party administrator. Uh, the most uh, common third party administrator that I deal with is a company called CJW. It's a great company. Um, they do a good job, but unfortunately, they're relying on these third party adjusters and engineers to make their decisions. And most of the time, that's where the decisions are made that are wrong. So if you're dealing with the Lloyds of London, for example, um, you're dealing with a TPA. And as a result, or an American Coastal, you're going to be dealing with a TPA. Why is that important? Because we need to know who has the authority to pay the claim. Who can I, after a decision has gone bad or a decision was made that was wrong, where can I usurp the authority from that desk adjuster or that claims manager and get someone that actually has the authority to pay the claim to review the information and make the right decision? That's the advantage of hiring people that specialize in a particular area of law is they understand who to talk to and what to provide them. This is an example of understanding who you're talking with and who can actually make the decision to pay the claim. What is a public insurance adjuster? A public insurance adjuster is a insurance adjuster that does not work for the insurance company like an independent adjuster, but actually works for you as a policyholder or a property manager. They're the ones that will help you. Um, the public adjuster field in the state of Florida is a licensed and regulated profession by the Department of Financial Services. Public adjusters get paid to scope the loss, they will inspect the property, they will document the damages, and I can assure you that in my experience, they do a much better job than most of the independent adjusters that I have seen of documenting the full extent of the loss and providing a legitimate estimate to the insurance company to pay the claim. Public insurance adjuster is a great option. Um, immediate, immediately following the storm, a public adjuster will assist the, the property manager or assist the association in documenting the damages. A lot of times, my law firm, we hire public adjusters as consultants. So if, if we're getting hired directly by the policyholder, um, we can hire the public adjuster to assist us in that process with writing an estimate and documenting the damages. Uh, public adjusters are typically paid on a contingency agreement because um, a lot of times the insurers do not have the money to pay them on an hourly basis. Uh, whenever we work with public adjusters, we typically would hire them as a consultant, pay them hourly um, if, if they're the right person for the job. But it's a good option if a public adjuster can step in on a claim, help the association, and get what's, what's owed by the insurance company. Now, a public adjuster can write an estimate. A public adjuster can negotiate your insurance claim. A public adjuster cannot file a lawsuit for you. So that's a big distinction that I've had people ask me, um, well, can my public adjuster file a lawsuit? The answer is no, but they can negotiate your insurance claim. Uh, what is reinsurance? Another common question that I get. Um, reinsurance is, is kind of self-explanatory, but how it works is, is a whole different story. Um, reinsurance is essentially insurance for your insurance company. So when you pay a premium that you pay annually to your insurance company, they're actually taking a portion of that premium and that goes to their operations. And then they're actually purchasing a bigger policy uh, for that property for reinsurance against another insurance company. So you may be insured with American Coastal and they may have reinsurance with Lloyd's of London. And so you may not know that, but part of your premium is gonna be paying for that reinsurance. So again, why is that important for you to know? Well, it's important because a lot of times in mediations, I may be filing a lawsuit or dealing with an insurance company A, like let's call it American Coastal, for example. If they've got reinsurance, they may not be the ones that are actually authorized to pay what I need for that claim. They may be directly communicating with the reinsurance company. So I always wanna make sure that I understand who's actually the one responsible for paying the claim so I can ensure that they have the information they need to make the right decision. Another big issue over the last few years is something called an assignment of benefits or an assignment of claim. So 
what is an assignment of benefits or claim? It's essentially a legal contract, and in the state of Florida, they're legal, and they're allowed, and it allows a association to, or any policyholder for that matter, to assign their rights under the insurance contract to a third party, like a contractor. The most common example would be a contractor to do work at the property in exchange for the rights to collect those monies from the insurance company, right? Um, the most common example that I see after Hurricane Irma are roofing contractors uh, who come out and they will agree to tarp the roofing systems, to mitigate the damages without charging the association up front. And they agree to provide an estimate to the insurance company, they agree to negotiate the claim for the insured, and they agree to meet the adjusters and engineers at the property. And most importantly, they agree to document the damages to provide to the insurance carrier. For all those services, they get an assignment of benefits document in exchange that allows them to recover the money from the insurance company for the work performed. You do wanna be careful um, to limit the assignment of benefits to the services being provided by that contractor. You know, a lot of times, and I, and I speak a lot to contractors, and they will do a blanket AOB or AOC, and of course, the concern with that is there's certain benefits that the association should maintain if the contractor's not going to do that work. Most of the times, the contractors will agree with that. They just did not realize the effect of the full assignment of benefits. So the question is, should you sign one? My recommendation is it depends on the facts and circumstances. I work with a lot of contractors that do a very good job, um, and a lot of them work with assignment of benefits because it really is a bargain for exchange. They want to ensure that if they're going to do work, that they're protected on the claim to get paid. Um, on the same token, I've, I've heard a lot of stories about assignment of benefits from policyholders that did not go well or have held up the process. So a lot of it just depends on the professionals that you're working with. Uh, my recommendation would be if you're going to deal with an assignment of benefits or an assignment of claim, please call Stephen or another partner at Sax Sax and Kaplan. Uh, they'll work with us to ensure that we review the agreement, that it is exactly what the parties intended to be, and then it works out really well. Um, the next uh, topic I want to discuss, and we have about another 10 to 15 minutes, is how do I resolve my claim? Like, what are the options? Because I'm frustrated. The insurance company is telling me that you know, I'm owed a certain amount of money. I've consulted with contractors and they tell me it's not enough. How do I resolve this? Or I have a denial for my insurance company. I did not have any leaks on any of my buildings. Um, as a property manager, you, you obviously get the complaints. Before the storm, I might have had one or two complaints a year. After Hurricane Irma or another storm, it went up in propensity and I was getting 10 complaints a month or five a week. Um, why are they not paying for my damages? And the answer to that is there's, there's really three or four different ways that a insurance claim that's under dispute can be resolved. Number one, a claim negotiation. A dispute over a contractor's pricing and scope of work should be able to be something that the contractor meets with the adjuster and they can resolve. Oftentimes, if you have a public adjuster, a lawyer, or a contractor, they resolve these claims every single day the insurance companies are financially motivated to pay less. Contractors are financially motivated to make more. So you have this inherent conflict of interest. Policyholders are going to want more money, and insurance companies are going to pay less. It's not brain surgery. You're going to have disputes. You're going to have conflict in this scenario because the more money the insurance company pays, the less money that they get to keep at the end of the year, right? The more money the policyholder gets for the job, Maybe they can negotiate upgrades. Maybe they have money to um, do the work um, and then also make sure that it's done 100% the right way. And so the frustration is the insurance companies do not have construction experience. So a lot of times the adjusters miss scope items, miss items within their estimates that the contractor is very frustrated with because they need those items to complete the work. This is the most common way, claim negotiation, that insurance claims are resolved in the country by far. Most claims get resolved through a claim negotiation. The second most common dispute resolution process when it comes to an insurance claim is called appraisal. 
not to be confused, I know my, my property managers and my associations have all heard the term appraisal. This is not a real estate appraisal. Think of it as an insurance claim appraisal. Um, essentially, it's where both parties would appoint a third party adjuster or consultant to serve as their representative of the claim to a appraisal panel. So it's policyholders appraiser, insurance company's appraiser, and then there's a third party umpire. The third party umpire is agreed to by the two appraisers involved in the appraisal panel. If they cannot agree, then the policy provides that you can file a, it's, it's an action, it's technically a lawsuit, but it's really not an adversarial lawsuit. It's a petition to appoint an umpire under the contract where you know, an attorney from Sachs, Saxon Kaplan or Merlin Law Group goes to a simple hearing. We provide a list of recommendations for an umpire. We attach CVs or resumes of the three or four people we're recommending. The defense counsel does the exact same thing and the judge plays pin the tail on the donkey and picks an umpire. That's literally how it works. I wish I could tell you it was more complicated than that. It's really not. Um, of course, I've been doing this for 10 years. So the first time I did that, it was probably much more complicated. But the point is, is that you get the umpire. Then here's the important part about the appraisal process. Whatever decision is made by that panel, if any two of the three agree, both parties are stuck with that result. I'm going to say that again with an example. Policyholders asking for $5 million. Insurance company says it's only $2 million. There's a dispute. Appraisal is invoked. There's an umpire. The policyholder's appraisal or appraiser submits the $5 million estimate. The insurance company's appraiser submits the $2 million estimate. If that umpire comes back at $4.5 million, that's binding on both the insurance company and the policyholder if one of the appraisers agree to it, period. That means if the appraiser for the insurance company wins the day and it's, and it's $2 million and the umpire agrees, you, the policyholder, are stuck with the $2 million award. It's binding. So appraisal is mandatory for participation. And the results are binding if any of the if the umpire essentially agrees with either one of the appraisers. The other thing to be aware of is that the appraisal process um, is it costs money. It's not something that's a covered benefit under your policy. That means that the association has to come out of pocket and pay the appraiser fee as well as half of the umpire fee. That's important to know, um, which we can talk about in a different webinar about the appraisal process in more detail about who can serve as the appraiser and things like that. Uh, the next option is, is litigation. This is uh, more often than not what I'm involved in. I am involved or my firm is involved a lot of times with appraisal processes, appointing an umpire, appointing um, an appraiser, uh, hiring experts to participate in that appraisal process. All those things we do have involvement in, but the majority of the claims that I handle um, are ones that are going to be in litigation at that point if we cannot resolve through the claim negotiation process. So let me make one point that's clear. A lot of my claims are settled in the claim negotiation process. So I get involved, I hire the experts, or my attorney for my firm gets the experts, we submit the package with the proof of loss, and the insurance company will hire someone, whether it's a claims manager or an attorney that I deal with, and we can resolve those claims. If that process fails, then another option is litigation. Uh, litigation in a first party property context is, it, it can be, um, you know, it, it can be intimidating to a lot of policyholders. So a lot of questions that I get from the property manager is what's expected out of me? So if we take this next step, what do I have to deal with? And what does my board have to deal with? And my response is consistently, we need your help with getting documents, which you've probably already put together for the insurance company. And number two, just like an EUO, we're going to need someone's participation in deposition. And then we're going to have, you know, some of my associations, I have weekly phone calls. Um, my Fridays are usually spent with back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back phone calls with associations, okay? Just updating them on the claims. We'll send them a document. They'll have a question. Um, and that's typically how we update the boards. 
So what we need is documents and participation, um, but we're going to we're going to carry the heavy lifting. My law firm is going to assist with the document production. We're going to assist with the discovery. We're going to uh, take the depositions, defend the depositions, and hire the experts, and we front those expenses. Uh, the biggest question I get when it comes to litigation is how long does it take, and how much is it going to cost? Well, the timetables change because of COVID-19. But most of our cases are going to be resolved between six and nine months, um, unless there's a trial that's required. Furthermore, in the state of Florida, and this is very, very important, there's a statute. It's 627-428. It's an attorney fee statute. And this statute is unique. There's only about seven to nine jurisdictions in the country that have an attorney fee statute. There's only two or three that have an attorney fee statute that is like Florida's attorney fee statute. I believe, I know it's Nebraska, and I believe Oregon as well has what I call a one-party fee statute. And this statute provides that if you, if your association has to retain, you know, SSC and Merlin Law Group to pursue the claim through litigation, and we prevail in that litigation, whether it's through summary judgment, whether it's through settlement, or whether it's through trial, the insurance company has to pay and reimburse the association for attorney's fees and for taxable costs. It's very important to understand. Now, I want to be clear. I, you know, the next question I always get is, Larry, how does that work in a mediation or settlement? The insurance company is fully aware of this statute. They're fully aware of the exposure that this statute creates. So it allows the parties to be in what I call equal footing at a mediation because the insurance company is the one that's cutting the check. So they're always going to have the upper hand in the litigation in most jurisdictions. In Florida, this is the true equalizer. This means that, hey, you want to stand by your position. You want to stand by your faulty investigation. You want to stand by your biased engineers. Go for it. Because if you lose, you're going to have to reimburse my client for all my attorney's fees and taxable costs. I know that sounded very aggressive. The real way it plays out is this. If we have a $1 million dispute, we go to mediation. We don't, we're not offering a $1 million to resolve the case. We're going to offer $1.5 million to resolve the case. We're going to add in the attorney's fees and costs that the insurance company knows that they're going to have to pay if they lose. The insurance companies in the state of Florida are very familiar with that. They fully understand and appreciate that the association is looking to recover sufficient funds to resolve the claim. With Hurricane Irma cases, that's typically going to be the cost to replace roofs and sometimes the cost to replace windows. But they know that you've had to hire a lawyer and they fully expect when they are assessing these claims, those legal fees and costs. So the biggest advantage in litigating in Florida versus other jurisdictions like Georgia or Missouri is that if we prevail, we're able to get our attorney's fees and costs on top. The next question I get often about hiring a lawyer for litigation from property managers as well as from associations is what happens if we lose? Do we have to reimburse you know, SSC and Merlin Law Group for those expenses in time? Uh, the answer is no. The marketplace for what we do is typically gonna be a contingency agreement between the association and our law firms. That means that if we do not prevail, we do not recover our fees and expenses from the association or our client. That's why it is very important that the sooner you can get us involved after these storms, the better, because we want to fully assess these claims because we're not going to invest in claims that we do not believe um, more money is not owed or that the insurance company has adjusted properly. And, and frankly, I have on many occasions told my clients that the contractor that they hired is wrong or that the public adjuster I disagree with or another attorney I disagree with. I do not believe that any more money is owed. As a result of that, I do not take the case or my law firm does not agree to take the case. So we definitely want to properly investigate the claim, make sure that if we're in it, we're in it to win it. And that's why we like to do a proper evaluation. Um, Another topic, and then we're about finished, is bad faith. I hear a lot of lawyers, a lot of adjusters, a lot of contractors that talk about bad faith, and honestly, they just have no idea what they're talking about. Um, I don't mean that to be rude, but 
as you can imagine, after a hurricane, um, one of the biggest reasons why I respect what Sachs Sachs and Kaplan is doing is they specialize in an area of law that I would not be able to even have a discussion with them on. They would just, they'd blow me out of the water. Um, they also appreciate that we specialize in an area of law. And I believe what they're doing is in the best interest of their clients by working with us, because this is all that we do. But there's a lot of lawyers that are car accident lawyers or, um, you know, HOA lawyers or, um, you know, any type of lawyer, criminal defense lawyers, all of a sudden throw up billboards, all of a sudden they become special, uh, specialized in insurance and they mislead clients. They settle for claims that a lot of money should have been paid on and the insurance companies love them. It's like shark bait. They know that if they're dealing with people that they've never heard of, they're able to, um, you know, throw some money at them and they'll go away or take advantage of them on a summary judgment issue that they should be better prepared for. I say all of that. Because I hear a lot of attorneys or clients will tell me that this attorney says that I can do this and this and I can get bad faith. The reality is, is um, bad faith damages in Florida are going to be unique to every single case, but there's not a statutory penalty um, or punitive damages unless you can prove a business practice. Uh, but I digress. I want to talk about first, what is bad faith? Uh, bad faith is essentially unfair claims handling. There is a uh, National Association of Insurance Commissioners that are run by insurance companies these guys that in good faith want to establish rules because good insurance companies don't want to compete with bad insurance companies because if bad insurance companies are not paying claims they're making more money than the good insurance companies and then they can offer lesser premiums and it becomes a race to the bottom instead of having standards at the top so this naic this national association of insurance commissioners they have an association from every state is represented and they come together and they provide these model claim acts, these guidelines that these obligations and duties that all insurance adjusters should hope and comply with. And they're required to comply with them. I mean, one of the most basic obligations is to treat the insured, you or your client in good faith. What does that mean? Well, that means you're not trying to play gotcha. You're not trying to hide documents. You're not going to improperly delay the claim because you can. If you know you owe money, pay what you owe. You don't use money that um, you know is owed to negotiate disputed money. I mean, that's Adjuster Ethics 101, right? So there's all these standards. It's actually a document that lays out rules that adjusters have to comply with. And when the adjusters or the insurance companies fail to comply with those rules, then they are subjected to a statutory action in bad faith. That means that after you prevail in your breach of contract, you're able to sue them again for a tort for bad faith. It's really unfair claims handling, but it's we call it bad faith. Um, we, we can discuss, we can have a whole another seminar all day long about unfair claims handling and practices and remedies and burden of proof and stuff like that, which we won't talk about today. But I say all of that because there's a very important prerequisite in the state of Florida that if you ever want the opportunity to hold the carrier accountable for their unfair claims practices, you have to file what's called a civil remedy notice. A civil remedy notice is a fancy term um, for a complaint. It is a uh, formal complaint. It's a form that you file online. You definitely want a lawyer to complete this form because it's interpreting statutes. It's providing information. Um, the good news for my property managers and the, and the associations that we're talking to today, this is a service that is something that, you know, Sachs, Sachs and Kaplan will provide with our law firm um, immediately on, on any claim that we feel one is necessary. We'll do a free evaluation and we'll evaluate if a civil remedy notice needs to be filed. Um, it's a couple hours of work to verify the proper uh, facts and circumstances that need to be included uh, to make sure that you allege the proper statutes that have been violated. So very important to understand that you have to file this document before you ever bring a bad faith action. And again, a lot of lawyers that are not familiar with this type of law, they will never file a civil remedy notice on a claim that one should have been filed on. And then after an appraisal award or after a jury verdict, they're not allowed to bring a bad faith claim. So understand that there are conditions preceding to ever getting there that if you don't know what you're doing, you're going to mess it up. 
And so you have to get a CRN or a civil remedy notice on file, again, assuming it's valid, before you can ever bring a bad faith action. Here is uh, some uh, condominium hurricane preparedness guides. If you click on these, um, and this PowerPoint is provided, it's, it's a handout. So in the little chart for this GoToMeeting, there's, there's a uh, handout that says Larry6241 uh, Power PDF. And if you click on this link of this PowerPoint, this will give you a hurricane preparedness guide that um, the two law firms got together and we put this information in here. Some of the information that I'm talking about today is included in this um, guide, but there's also additional information that I believe every property manager and every association should be aware of. It's free, please review it. If you have any questions, please let us know and we'll get with you on that. Okay, so the, my, my biggest red flag when I meet with an association or property manager is they don't ever ask me about results. And I, I don't know if, it's, if people are uncomfortable with talking about results or whatever the reason is, it's always surprising to me that they will hire me without ever asking me for a result or a reference. Now understand that I'm a trial attorney I like to speak with people, I'm good at speaking with people, but I shouldn't be that good at speaking with people that no one ever asks me, Larry, what has your firm done? Tell me results, tell me references. Every single time I sit down with an association, I give them references of local other associations that my firm has worked with, or I have specifically worked with. And we have these success stories that we share with our clients. Um, this is a, a success story, for example, of an association that we took from below deductible, okay, this claim went from below deductible to nine and a half million dollars for settlement, okay? And the association is thrilled, as you can imagine, they got all new roofs, they are very happy with the result of the case, and I'm very happy with the result of the case, and I'm proud of that result for the case, and my law firm is proud of the result for this case, and we want you to call our clients, we want you to call these different uh, boards and ask them, how did Mr. Bache communicate? How did Chip Merlin communicate with you? How did Mr. Austin communicate with you? Um, how did Ms. Kubiak and Mr. Delgado communicate with you? Um, you know, how was the result? Did they work with you in preparation? What was your overall impression of them? Because we're meeting with them. Now, obviously, Sax Sax and Kaplan has vetted us quite a bit to get here. And so a lot of that has already been done for a lot of you property managers. Obviously, you, you know, you trust your, your association's attorney and you work with them a lot. But please, anytime that a lawyer is meeting with you or, or our firm, ask us for success stories. Click on this, read about it, call our client. They'll tell you all about the result and how the process worked. Um, this was another example of a case that we resolved. This, this is all 2020. This is all hurricane related. Um, you know, these were, this was about, I believe, it's two different associations, um, about two and a half million dollars a piece that the insurance company said was below deductible again. I mean, very commonly what I see is the losses do not exceed the deductible after a hurricane. Um, this is another seven figure settlement. And this is just recently, we, we have a lot of other success stories and references. I walk in every presentation with a list of them that you can call, make sure you're comfortable with who you're working with. Okay, lastly, um, Chip Merlin, who is um, the founder and president of our law firm that we talked about, he wrote a book and it's called Pay Up. Um, and it's a great book about insurance claims. And this book is on Amazon and it's $15 on the Kindle or you can buy the audio book for $14. The one that I'm holding here is uh, $18.69. And it's, it's a great book. It gives you a 30 year history of Chip's experiences um, kind of giving you the why that insurance companies don't pay, gives you information on success stories and why insurance companies uh, sometimes need to have a, get a little bit of help on what they owe from lawyers and uh, policyholders. So it's a great book. I recommend to read. It's an easy read because it's not technical. It's very, uh, it's, it's story based. It gives examples. Um, there's, there's a large bad faith case that I, I discuss in this book or Chip discussed for me. Um, and discusses a case from State Farm where uh, the insured thought they were owed $25,000. Uh, we got them $2.3 million in bad faith. Um, that's, on, that's on page 89 in the book. 
So I'm very proud of that because I, I, I was mentioned on a, on a case that was very important to me for my clients. So definitely recommend that if you want to get to know Chip Merlin a little bit, uh, read the book. And that way, um, you know exactly who you're working with. So uh, lastly, we've got our website. We've got our phone number on here because that's typical of any PowerPoint. But you guys obviously know Sax Sax and Kaplan. Uh, please reach out to them if you have any claims. Um, let them know you, you, you saw the webinar with Larry Beige, that you'd like to meet Larry Beige or Chip Merlin. And we'll come down and meet with you and answer any questions that you have with Stephen or, or another uh, partner over there at the firm. So I'm going to finish up here. I don't see any questions posted. If you do have any questions, let us know. At this time, I just want to say thank you so much for your time today. Um, I look forward to working with anybody that needs our help. Thank you.